Slimehouse TV, myself the OK, and hope everybody is good. Hold tight the Slime Alliance, the Slime Renegades, and everybody else that's locked in for some toy talk. And in today's episode, I've got a guest on the show. It's not very often that I do these video podcast kind of episodes, but when I've got a guest like this, I can't not do them. So in today's episode, I'm going to be talking to Brandon Braswell, who is the creator of the 9 to 5 Warriors. So the 9 to 5 Warriors are a toy line that feel like they should have come out in the 1980s, but they're very much a new release. And they're coming out 2023. The shipping, providing you get on the pre-orders and you support it, but we'll talk all about that in the video. So this is a guy, I love his work ethic, he's a dude, he's got awesome influencers, and the sculptor that he's got involved to help him create these is an absolute legend. So without further ado, let's get into it. Let's talk to Brandon Braswell, the creator of the 9 to 5 Warriors. I can't wait for this, let's go. Brandon, how you doing? Brandon Braswell, creator of the 9 to 5 Warriors. How are we doing today? It's an honor to have you on the show. Likewise, man. Thank you so much for having me. I love to like have the opportunity to chat about a passion project, so I appreciate the invite. Well, this seems like very much a passion project because I, I, when I was looking into these, I mean, if we go all the way back to like when I first started to hear about the 9 to 5 Warriors, I'm just seeing them pop up in like my, my toy groups. I'm part of like toy chat groups, nerdy chat groups, so we talk about action figures and things like that, guys our age that are still into this stuff. Uh, and they kept popping up like, oh, have you seen these? Because they were so reminiscent of obviously the Food Fighters. Um, and then when I when I did like a little bit of a deep dive into them, I found out that like you'd been trying to get these made since 2014. So that like is like a yeah. super passion project. And also what I loved about them is Food Fighters, now nah, they've not been in the ether like, that long they've always been around and you've got people like you and i that will have done a deep dive on them years ago and been into them but like for your main general toy collector i find it's only in the last few years where they've become really popular again and that's when you would see companies like trying to jump on this stuff and bring it back and be like oh what's what was popular what's popular now what we can like buy up and we can reproduce and stuff but you've seen like a guy that was on this like way before all the other people discovered it was cool again <laughs> No, nah, man, for real. Honestly, when as a as a kid, I discovered Food Fighters like in 1993. So at that point, it was already discontinued. And yeah. it was just through a friend's uh, older brother kind of passed down the line to him and I fell in love with them. At that same time, I was like a creative kid using like my own school supplies as action figures. I would make like Major Racer, for instance, one of the, the lead characters is one of those direct outputs of what I used to make as a kid. I'd stick a thumbtack and a pink eraser's eye, draw on a face, and use paperclip as his arms and legs. Yeah. So seeing Food Fighters, like it just instantly resonated with me as such a unique toy and just creative. So yeah, I it was one of the first toys that I started picking up again once I decided to create my own toy and do my research of buying <laughs> older toys and like yes. made them all tick and the packaging and stuff. So not, uh, Food Fighters is always like that go-to, like my favorite unknown toy. And when I was looking at like your, even your original pitch for these back in 2014, because you can still find that that website is still active. Like when I was looking through, like I'll do a bit of research before I chat to you and stuff, see if there's anything I've missed. And I had no idea that it came out back in 2014. But that's like, uh, this, I don't know if it's a Kickstarter or some kind of thing like that, or just like a, to a website talking that you're wanting to get and produced. And I know you've got a made as a, like a set of cards and stuff, but when we can see like yeah. the original 3D prints that you were creating, and even back then you had like an animated uh, ad com TV commercial for them and stuff. Like just tell me, a little bit about like how you got them started like back then when you actually started you know, like to create them as actual 3d models and then getting like an animated advert done because that's still something that's really unique now like you still don't have these yeah. toy companies really doing that now for releases so authentic thank you thank you so the, the original idea started like in 2012 um or 13 ish uh i wanted to create a toy so the story for me was like i went to this toy store randomly and was like hit with nostalgia. And I was like, what? This is amazing. I forgot about this line. I forgot about this line. And it like literally unlocked so many memories yeah. that I felt that like nostalgia rush, which then led to the room that surrounds me full of all these older toys. But back then I honestly didn't collect toys and I had no interest in it. My background is in filmmaking and storytelling. So I know the beauty of storytelling through visuals, video, as you know, like you can really convey a message through that. This was the first time I ever felt anything like this with a physical product. So my mind just went into like, oh my God, I want to do that. I want to make a toy. As a kid, like I said, I was creative and made my own action figures and I did want to make a toy, but like as a kid, you like didn't really take it seriously. 
when that happened in 2012 ish, like I was like, I want to make a toy. Like I like was fixated. Like I need to make that sensation again for the generation growing up or for other people like myself that like forgot this was a creative time period. You know, the nineties was yeah. the, the last of, I feel the era of like creativity and toys. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree in many ways. Yeah. To- toy companies actually try things. They, they weren't going on like, algorithms and data and trusting mm. trends and shit like they were just like threw something on a wall saw what stuck and they executed it food fighters is a perfect example of that and i think the reason it failed was because of exactly that it had no story had no cartoon had nothing to give the characters meat to so going back to that 2012 how i got started is i wanted to make a toy but i had no means or understanding of even how to go about doing so but I know story and I know filmmaking. I know everything about story. So I wanted, I looked at the toys around me that I love, like the GI Joes, Ninja Turtles, Street Sharks, all that stuff. And to me, what made them special was story. So exactly that is like, I just started going ham there. I just started creating the character bios, the, the, the rough sketches and just the general idea of this world I created. And from there, I just treated it like a film project. Like I was the producer. Like, let me find the the illustrator. Let me find the animator. Let me find this, this, and that. I can fully see it. Yeah. <laughs> 2014 came is when I launched, and as I said, the means was let me just get the story out there via trading cards or the comic book, and then the the animated intro for me was like that's what's gonna make it. You know, <laughs> every TV show I loved growing as a kid had the 60 second jingle that would get stuck in your head. You'd see the montage of everything, how it came to be and how they interact with one another. So I thought that was like a perfect way of getting around, you know, not having a TV series. I can have a TV intro to a show that doesn't exist (laughs) yet. But yeah, that's how it all kind of came together. Well, I can fully see that. Like when you've done your animated intro, I've only watched those animated intros that you did, but I feel like I'm invested in that story now and I know these characters. And in many ways, you've given those characters more backstory than like something like the Food Fighters that was a cool toy with no backstory ever had. And I was also saying that like we're in an era now where people are like rediscovering how cool this is and it's back kind of not in the mainstream, but it's very close to that with stuff like the Food Mm -hmm. Fighters. But you were like a prime example of someone that was ahead of their time. And this is also a good example of something that, because I know you didn't manage to get the toys made back in the uh, like 2012, 2014 times, but now yeah. that you have, and the fact that now this stuff's popular again, it means that's perfect for you because then there's something that didn't work out back then is now working out for you. And these are toys that have been produced, like mass produced. 100%. And timing is everything. Um, so back then, I didn't know again how to go about making a toy using my limited knowledge of like what can I Google quickly and what can I kind of figure out on my own. I just hired a 3D sculptor or like I, I kind of just hired like anyone that can make me a model. Yeah. I didn't know you needed, you know, a real toy maker to make something. Good. Like just because I had them 3D molded and sculpted did not make it a good toy. And that was like expensive mistakes I learned along the way. Back then, I literally hired a, a small team on like freelancer.com or something like that. And they... Sh- they created what you saw in that article, which was basically a 3D printing company that I used to print them. Yeah. They discovered them because I sent them to get printed. And they're like, holy crap, this is cool. Can we like make an article about you? And at that oh, point, I was awesome. like, oh, shit, I'm, I'm onto something. If the people that I'm sending it to kind of like are reacting in this way. And I, I mean, you said there that like you've wasted a bit of money getting them made by someone that wasn't a toy maker. But some of those designs, well, all of pretty much like 99% of the des- designs that I saw, even though... They've now been sculpted again, and I want to talk about that in a minute, like who sculpted them after and things. But yeah. a lot of the ideas that was in those original ones is stuff that's carried on to now the final product, like Major Eraser, the, the original maquette that you made to the new one that's been sculpted by Scott is like, it's obviously an updated version, but it's still the same character design. Yeah, everything everything from their character designs, every single thing is the same as it was in 2012. So like um, the Wax Fact, I got these printed in 2014. So technically they're all vintage. They're like, (laughs) they they were designed. (laughs) They're designed to be vintage and printed in the actual factory. That still was the only United States factory that produced anything like this. And now that they're like, they're, it's 2022 now. (laughs) Like they're pretty much actually vintage. So it worked out. Like I said, timing's everything. 
Um, but all the character designs, everything was created back then. And it's just taken me this whole period to get to where I'm at now. And that's why, I mean, this is like such a passion project for you because a lot of people might have thrown in the towel after a couple of years that it didn't work out. We all know those people that's had a good idea and then after a couple yeah. of years, they've, they've even something like a YouTube channel, people hammer it for six months a year and then get bored because it's not working out. But you obviously stuck with that. Did you work on anything like in the meantime other like ideas? I, I know like you, you work, obviously, you've, you, I know like a bit about what you do work-wise and things, but um, what what is it that helped you get from like that starting point where they didn't quite work out to now other than the fact that this stuff's just like really popular again? No, so truthfully, I did give up. I put so much into this. And then, um, as you, you're alluding to, you start getting in your own mind of like, I, I can't do this anymore. Like, I'm putting it out there. And like, just because I sent it to a few people and they didn't reply, or um, I wasn't getting likes on Instagram and sh- shit like that, just really just got to me. And of course, everything's self financed. And I was broke. Yeah, like, yeah. And I'm just throwing it out there. I'm trying to hopefully it gets stuck. Or something sees me because I just wanted to make the toys. But because I was making everything else before the toys and then had that bad experience with like that crappy molds, like I kind of just like, I don't know how to do this. Let me just wait for now because my. Felt a bit out of your depth at the time when you were first starting. Yeah. yeah. And like career wise, I had the opportunity to start a business and start traveling, and that's what I did. So, but in the back of my mind for those years, it was just like itching at me, like get back into yeah. it, get back into it. And then pandemic hit. Um, and I felt like that was, so my, my business was travel and of course pandemic hit, everything shut down. So that was like, for me, the opportunity to like, let me look back into the toy making <laughs> aspect. Like it was expensive back then. I invested in Doge, <laughs> Dogecoin for the wing. So I was like, <laughs> let, let me get some, let me put this money towards, uh, uh, nine to five warriors. And yeah, I discovered Scott Henze, which is the, now the sculptor of nine to five warriors. Yeah, so just to put a pin in what we were just saying then, um, because I, obviously I want to talk about the Scott Hensey thing in a second, but sure. I find that when you have those ideas that like niggle away in the back of your head, and and I find that if if a good few years have gone by, like three four years have gone by, five years, and it's still an idea that you think's fresh and still thinks cool, they're always the ones that you kind of have to eventually jump on because there's a reason why you still think they're cool. Everyone's had an idea for like a tattoo, and then four years later, thought, oh, I'm glad I didn't get that. But then there's <laughs> some ideas that you have, and you still think, yo, do you know what? That's still a good idea. I still need to do that. And, and obviously, the nine to five warriors uh, again, a prime example of that. And, and then it must have been the the ultimate buzz when uh, you you got Scott Hensey involved. I want to ask a little bit about like yeah. how that came around. But to anybody that doesn't know, Scott Hensey is like an OG toy sculptor. Some of like my favorite toys ever. If we're talking like Casey Jones, Playmates, Toxic Crusaders, Everything. all this stuff, Extreme Dinosaurs, Skeleton Warriors. Like if you look at his resume, this guy is like the the reason that we love half of this stuff is due to these people and Scott Hensey is one of them. So just tell me a little bit about like how that yeah. came around. Cause that's a dream come true. You couldn't ask for a better sculptor to work on your, on your toys. No, man, it's exactly that. Like, it's insane that I discovered him through Instagram randomly. And at the time, like I was debating going back into it. And when I discovered him, um, I saw that he did the original Ninja Turtle lines, just the, the bad guys primarily. So mm-hmm. Shredder basically beat Bob Rocksteady, all of them. Like he did all the evil villains and I was like, oh my God, he's perfect. And he still does it by hand. So really quickly, 9 to 5 Warriors, it was really important for me to like that keep that authenticity. So like I said, the wax packs are authentic. The, yeah. Even the way the animation was done roughly by hand and then eventually into the digital realm. Um, so for making the toys, it was like really imperative for me. Like I experimented with the 3D. They look like shit. Now, <laughs> like I really wanted that feel. And I discovered him and like we just hit it off. And like, I shit you not, every time I spoke to Scott or he posted something new, I was like, son of a bitch, he sculpted that too? And it's like, yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. that. And that's what he's like, looking at his Instagram. It's half my collection. Yeah. Exo Squad, uh, Street Sharks. It's just like mind blowing that like so much of our childhood went through this man's hands. It was insane. And a lot of Happy Meal toys, which will show like where that uh, experience come, shines through in like characters like Commodore Chris. And it's just like, I was like, fuck yeah, this is going to be awesome. Like, timing worked out yada yada like everything just felt right yeah and and because he it's him sculpting them that's again where that authenticity comes from when you i've not held one of these in hand but i've seen them up close and there's a because i do 3d toy sculpting like i i I, first admit that's like that's like one of my like big gigs that i do but 
you, there's something about uh, something that's hand sculpted where you can see a little bit where a thumbprint's in. You can see where they've scraped the tool through it and stuff. It does have that authenticity. And if you're wanting to create something, which in, in, in 100% you have, feels like something that came from a time machine that was just found in a capsule. <laughs> like you've gone into an old warehouse and all these toys never got put on shelves, but they was made back then. And I feel that's what they feel like. That was actually one of the marketing ideas I had. I was like, now I'm in this phase of like, how do I get this brand out there, you know? Yeah. And one of the things I saw from Scott and other uh, sculptors from that that time period, they would just like open up a book and like, hey, these are the sculpts that never made it. And they're yeah. cool, unique ideas. And I was like, oh shit, like what if Mind of Five Warriors was like, you know, exactly that. Discovered from the 90s warehouse, unboxed, I have the animation. And that's something that like, I could probably do that, but I didn't want to be deceitful, you know? I'm just yeah, keeping it. It's a 90s inspired action figure and it's actually a, it's a timepiece. So if the show ever does get made, it will be set in the 90s. It's all very yeah, much yeah, in that to. realm. And so, yeah, going back to Scott, um, I found a unique balance because I'm not going to lie, doing hand sculpted now left me with some new issues. Like the factories needed like either digital uh, digital copies or I'd have to send them the physical prints, yeah, which yeah. I was limited and they're expensive and they're fragile. And then they did need to be updated so that it's properly done for today's standards so like technology has obviously changed in the last what 30 years that scott has been doing toys like it, it's a amazing story now like that i'm like trying to hype like the fact that this man has created so much of our toys and never got credit or never has like a you know any anything that's like literally about him and how he's done these toy lines was really important for me to like give this mm -hmm. man credit he's got a, a you know uh, I put a receipt on the back of the, the packaging like of literally the credits of everyone involved in making the toy from the music to the product shots to the design. So it was really important for me to like keep highlighting Scott. So like cutting to now, I did find a unique balance. Like I was saying, doing stuff hand, uh, hand sculpted found some flaws in a sense of like how to get it produ produced. So now I worked with like a local company to 3D scan everything Scott does. And then I worked with another 3D sculptor from another um, indie line called Plunderlings. And then yeah, I know Plunderlings. Really I've, talked to, I've talked to that guy before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know Ricky's awesome. Yeah. And so my sculptor is Seba from Seba uh, from Planetary Dog Toys. Okay. And so he, I found an awesome balance of like working with Scott and then working with Seba to find this like nostalgic modern day sculpt that you see now in the toys. And I had such a blast of both of those sculptors. I actually did technically 50-50 with, so half the, the, the sculpts are with Scott and half the sculpts are with Seba because some of them were really like Sergeant Scotchy, for instance, who has the working mechanics of a stapler. Got a tape I mean, oh, sorry, of tape. That couldn't have been done by hand to that like near perfect, you know, precision that it needed to be done. Yeah. So it was awesome to actually work with a digital sculptor and like, flip it on this head too of like as you know in 3d sculpting you have like the the cool cheat codes of like sy symmetry where you draw yeah, on one yeah, side I, I told my guy like <laughs> granted I'm, this is all self-finance and like yeah. everything's expensive i was like turn off all that shit and like still do it by hand like so that you still kind of have unevenness and you kind of can get that feel of what as you were alluding to like handmade has yeah yeah because well, it's it's kind of like when when you're like working in film and stuff. I'm um, obviously, and I'm I'm sure you're similar when it comes to like your old like B movies and stuff. You love the practical effects, and whenever you see a film yeah. now and it's got like practical effects or a puppet, you're watching Mandalorian, you see Baby Yoda as a puppet and things, Grogu. Like you can't beat that. But then you know that they've also done a little bit of digital augmentation. His eyes and how they'll glisten will be a bit digital. You see like 100%. Walking Dead, and they've got like one of the zombies, and it's like practical effects, but then there's pieces of green on it where they're gonna like element it after we CG and I love that when it's like the old school and the new school come together exactly. to create something that's flawless and you've obviously got a bit of that with these then that's a perfect analogy I'm glad like honestly yeah I that's exactly that because I was even thinking of today like if I ever get the opportunity to make a movie like there's no way in hell I'm just gonna fucking do it all through green screen like you see some of these Marvel films yeah like, yeah yeah they're completely green I'm like I can't even wrap my head around that like kudos to the director can like envision all that shit when there's oh, nothing sure. and the actors of course but there's something about like literally building an entire set like the I'm sure I don't know if you watched that documentary series on Disney about um, Industrial Light and Magic. It's literally called Light and Magic. I have watched and some of them. Yeah, yeah, I watched them all, but I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's such that's the beauty of movie making, like having everyone on the team just kind of like 
figuring shit out. Like, how do we make this come to reality? Yeah, and, yeah. That's like watching the aliens making of exactly the same. Yeah. Where like, they're just like, how can we make this face so good jump towards screen? We need to pull it on a <laughs> wire, but then it's going to maybe miss the camera. And just thinking of those things on the spot, like how to, how that, I mean, that, that's a completely different conversation. That's filmmaking. But yeah, I love yeah. the idea of like, yeah, how to put this stuff together and thinking that when it's not just, oh, we'll fix it in post. No, we need to fix it now. <laughs> so the, all that energy is what I put into the toys today. And from the backstory to the freaking animation to now the, the physical molds and hopefully the final product if I reach my, my goal. So as an, at the moment, they're all for pre-order on Big Bad Toy Store and they have to reach you know X amount to ensure that they go into production. Right, okay. But so now that's the next stage is like getting out there. So again, thank you for having me on because opportunities oh, oh, like this sure. just help, dude. <laughs> No, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to preach the word because one of the things I wanted to ask you is, obviously, I'm not in America. You can tell by my accent, I'm over in England. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, when we're like getting anything sent from America, there's like, we always have problems with importing and stuff like that. A lot of the time, I'll see like some bargain and vintage toys and stuff. And I'm like, oh, I want to get that. But by the time that I've paid $20, $30 postage and then another $20, $30, $50 import fees, it costs more than the toy, so we don't bother. So... I, yeah. this, I wanted to ask about like what, what the deal is with stuff outside of America, but I take it it's, at the minute it's all through Big Bad Toy Store. We've got to hit that target before it's even a, a conversation. Yeah, I mean, trust, tr- trust me. Like Honestly, the, the end goal is for this to have its legs. I would love to have a TV show. The, the goal full nine yards of like, my, my tagline is like, recapture the magic of the Saturday morning cartoon era. Yeah, yeah. And what that means to me is like, re-sparking imagination. Like, as kids, we had the luxury of like watching TV and not like today where like Netflix has something to queue up right after and like make sure you never get off the couch. Like yeah, yeah, as, a kid, as a kid, you would watch the show, get off and then have take the imagine – like take what you saw on screen and into your hand and like you'd play with your toys. Like Ninja Turtles is a great example of like as a kid, I could have sworn they – were fully articulated i could have sworn they did backflips i could have sworn they yeah. bent at the arms and legs but holding one as an adult i was like what the fuck this is actually pretty limited this is crazy and that's because our imagination was just going off like we we took what we saw from those stories developed the characters in our mind and then took every single thing to the next level and that's what i'm hoping like with nine to five words i can tap back into that magic yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I can fully, I can fully understand that because we live in that culture now. Where it's like that binge culture where you, yeah. people watch a whole series and we, we're not given any time for our own imagination because there's always something else to bombard ourselves with. But like as a kid, you might have like three episodes of Ninja Turtles on one VHS and you'll rinse that over <laughs> and over. Uh, and uh, whereas, yeah, now like you. Uh, kids can go on Netflix and watch the entire series of some animated cartoon that they're watching, some CG thing. And it's just like, yeah, never any break to even imagine anything for yourself. So yeah, yeah. bring I'm all about bringing that magic back as well, bringing back that imagination. <laughs> so hopefully, yeah, uh, going to your question, like if this can get into UK or I don't know, at this point, I'm not, I'm a free agent. So it's not exclusive for yeah. Big Bad Toy Store. It's, it's open to the market and like, thankfully, I think I did the right thing of launching in 2014. So I have that like history of if you just yeah. look for it, it's there and you can see, you know, the progression of it all. And I don't know. I just feel like I'm just waiting for that moment to really just take it to the next level and make this happen. Like granted, I really do hope I can reach my goal to make these toys, but at the end of the day, like I will find a way to make them. Like, oh, I have these, no these doubt. going to yeah. happen. Yeah. Where like, are now we at, then at the minute? Sorry, sorry. So, you were saying. No, 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 no. Because now, like that, they're here. Like I just keep falling in love with them. I was like, shit, they're actually tangible now. This is cool. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm close to. I'm, I'm gonna say the fifty percent mark right now, which is awesome. And one thing I was worried about is that there's clear favorites. Usually, you know, everyone loves a which a certain turtle or someone loves a certain villain. And I'm grateful that like all the sales across all ten characters have been really even roughly like they're all around like a 20 figure degree of like you know there's a favorite which is commodore chris but then slightly followed by uh, colonel custard and then major racers right behind them and then there are none that are like damn like i wish i could have packaged them t- together so with a more or more popular characters so i can get the sales up like everyone's doing relatively well which is like perfect and that was my goal is kind of 
having enough that like any personality can relate to at least one or one or three of them, you know? Well, the thing is as well, you've definitely tapped into the collector by it. You've like got a good, there's a, there's a, there's a bunch of these. I mean, there's like, there's, there's like 10 <laughs> characters or something. So like, yeah, yeah. you're not going to go in and just buy five of them. You're going to, oh, I'm going to have to get the others. And even if there was one that you wasn't that into, you think, well, I bought all nine. I can't not get that one. So you've definitely <laughs> tapped into the collector thing. Just like I was showing my girl earlier and she's like, you're going to get some. And I'm like, well, if I get some, I'm going to get all of them. I ain't just going to get one or two. I need the whole line. <laughs> no, it's, that's what worked out in the end because, uh, when I first started with Scott, again, this is all self finance. I'm not rich by all means. I'm just hustling and make this kind of work. Um, I had the means to make one figure, which was Major Eraser. Um, once that came out, I was like, fuck, this looks amazing. This is like, it brought tears, honestly, when I opened that package from Scott to see He's something. He's the OG. You made him in school out of a real eraser. I get it. It was just insane, bro. So seeing it in my hand at that moment, I was like, I, I find a way I'll, I'll invest in Colonel Custard. Having the two of them is when I went forward with the Kickstarter last year and it didn't go through. I didn't know what I was doing with marketing. And like, I just, you need to really do marketing for Kickstarters like six to nine months prior. And yeah. I did everything at once, you know, press start in 30 days, basically just went ham. 28 days in is when people like started hearing about it. And then you have two hour, two, two days to raise. Hmm. But then like going back, like I really didn't know which characters to make next because the, the feedback at the end of the day was like, will you have more? Will like, what are the other characters? Like, can you, will you have this, this and that? And again, me <laughs> limited means I was like, uh, let me try to get one more done. And I couldn't decide which one I wanted myself. <laughs> yeah. So I, I ended up making two more and then I was like, oh, fuck it. Three more. Well, I can't just have six. I got to do all 10. <laughs> so while I like all 10 were made magically and yeah. I think people are resonating with with the fact that it feels cohesive. Well, let's see some of the toys, man. Have you got some there to show us? Let's, yes. let's see some of the characters. Talk me through them. If you watch this That's commercial, it. the animated commercial, and it gives you like a bit of feedback, like I was watching the one earlier with the two, with a pencil that got snapped in half, and now the two brothers <laughs> that hate each other. Absolute genius, man. So yeah, talk me through some of these characters and their backstories. 100%. Yeah, the story, like I said, was the number one thing. So for me to be able to tell a little bit of story in these commercials is, was really important. So first, we'll start off with actually the bad guys first. I like that a lot. So starting off with the leader of the bad guys, the bad guys are called the Break Room Bandits. You have uh, Colonel Custard. And essentially his story is that, let me backtrack. So 95 Warriors is set in the 90s, as I said, and a lone office worker, like a like a weird kind of cubicle dude named Alan McMillan creates these imaginary figures through his office supplies and lunch. Very much like I did as a kid, he'd make these little figures and like play one fateful night, just like in the nineties, these <laughs> a surge of electricity and a Japanese energy drink brings them all to life. So the stories that he would talk and the, the behaviors he did while they were inanimate objects got transferred, transferred to them as real life objects. So with the story of Colonel Custard is, since he's a delicious donut, you'll notice that he's, someone took a bite out of him. And at the moment he was stale and they're like, this is gross, they spit it out and tossed him in the trash. And because of that, like he has this resentment for humans and their wastefulness. So I love this, the call him basically like the Captain Amer oh, Captain Planet that's like gone rogue. He wants to save the planet, but like <laughs> he'll say some things that like really make sense about like single use plastics and shit. Like he'll just, come off on the humans and wants to make sure that they they never do what they did to him again so he's the leader of the break room bandits i like his catchphrase as well reuse recycle <laughs> revenge <laughs> <laughs> exactly it, and now uh, to his right would be his right hand lady and that's specialist sugar so again in going back to the alan's real world before she became who she is there is, there's a beautiful receptionist that Alan has a crush on and he would do to like her image and this and the sugar crystals and like fascinate the dream about her. So when the sugar packet got doused and brought to life, that's the character that she kind of portrays. She's a really powerful, strong, beautiful woman that like is the, the brains behind break room bandits. So without her, they're a bunch of like crazy henchmen that just can't get anything right. But she really like, draws them together yeah yeah her special ability is to basically transform into any object you know she can shape shift her way into any situation and the figure comes with two um extra sets of hands like a normal 
normal hands and then a shield and then she's got these like terminator 2 style like sword that like extends out yeah yeah i see it it's a little bit t1000 little bit sandman 100 percent. and and then like the hulk smash type arm yeah 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 <laughs> then next up do you want me to go all through them because yeah of course man all right no, i love no, no, it I, I, we, we need to see him we need to see him so next is number two so the break room bandits are all like th- discarded food and you'll notice that number two is a utensil so he's the odd man in the group and i like to say he's as rotten as the food that surrounds him and like the details that this was all hand sculpted by scott so the chewed pencil the chews that you can't you can't uh exactly can't that. i love it so back going back to alan mcmillan he in his office he had this one beautiful pencil his favorite pencil the perfect supply for any job basically and one day the office bully snaps it in half Alan being like a resourceful guy he is, he quickly sharpened, you know, to repair. And <clears throat> the one end with the eraser became a pencil again. Like that's his brother, which I'll show later, but he became Lieutenant Lead. Still a really good pencil, has an eraser head and the pointed, uh, the tip on the bottom. With number two, he sharpened both ends and he's like, well, we'll find a place for you. You know, like it's, you can't really use this pencil. You can't make a mistake with it. You're kind of stuck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So the pressure of never being able to make a mistake and the pressure of like trying trying to be perfect and as good as you know his brother Lieutenant Led gets to him and he becomes vindictive and he becomes evil. And he actually like when they come to life, he was part of the water cooler commandos, but he tried to take his spot uh, the number one spot and gets thrown out and he joins the bandits. So it was really important to me for like each of the factions to kind of have I'll allude to that later, like Corporal Kent, each of them to have, you know, one of like the other elements inside their group. So Corporal yeah, Can, yeah. the Peanuts, is with the Water Cooler Commandos, and I'll explain why later. But number two is awesome. And he's actually like, he's an ode to the Shredder figure, which Scott Henzi designed. And Shredder's like in yeah. that pose that was... Yeah, he was, yeah. Done specifically to save money and <laughs> keep all the packaging consistent between all the turtles. Yeah, because he's such an odd shape that one, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. He's like he's like such oddly crouched down, like he's dodging shurikens. <laughs> <laughs> so I love that stance, and you know, talking about storytelling again, I now have this ability to storytell through through sculpting, and that's yeah. where like Scott's you know ingenuity and like understanding like characters' background, like we were able to create these unique characters that like if you didn't have any backstory, you didn't have the commercial or the, the TV show in front of you. You can still gather that this guy's clearly a ninja. He looks menacing. He's ready to attack. He's standoffish. And those are the cool things that you can put into a pose. And you've got that Storm Shadow and Snake Eyes thing going on with the two brothers yeah. that are like <laughs> opposite sides of each other, like the yin and yang. I love it. Exactly. Uh, next up is Commodore Crisp, which is surprisingly everyone's favorite. So. Crisp is basically yeah. a. Sh- oh, I wonder why. St- He's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> so. Crisp is a stack of Pringles, and the genius behind that is, like, this goes goes to Scott and the years of experience. In my mind, I was like, how the hell am I going to make this toy? Because he's supposed to be a doppelganger. He splits into Mm -hmm. multiple characters. But to translate that into a figure was like, I just was thinking magnets. I was thinking other expensive avenues. Maybe they can – how do you hide their faces and ears? Or I don't know. Like, I didn't know how we can do it very simply and cost-effectively. And Scott came up with this brilliant of idea of like they literally just stack. It's fantastic, into and they stand up as well. He stands up, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Stands up perfectly. Oh man, so good. And then if you look inside, like hold on, get the focus. There's the spot for his feet. So basically, yeah, they, yeah. they stack in right, and they just stick. Oh man. Um, and they split into three doppelgangers. So this was like again the bottom side, and then they all have eyes, and it's just so clever. And it's just one of those things that they literally come apart and they're three separate characters. And Commodore Crisp is a little wacky. So I think every good army squad has like a communications team or something element. And that's what Commodore does. He's able to split into three minions. And what one sees, the other one sees. And what one feels, the other one feels. So they sounds like a good thing, but it's kind of like you get your brains all scrambled. <laughs> so he's yeah, not no, the most reliable. That. Yeah, it's, that's a clever way of looking at it, yeah. <laughs> And then last but not least is Spore, and he's the muscle. Yeah, he's yes, huge, exactly. that guy. So we've got so, like, such a variation of size between them and stuff as well, haven't we? He's like the biggest of yeah. those guys, right? 
So what was cool about this is again, like, so he's the largest. He's five point two five, while all the other ones fit in the realm of three, um, three and a quarter, so three point seven five. And the beauty of him, like, I wanted. He's the the brains. I mean, the sorry, not the brains. He's the exact opposite. Brown. <laughs> he's, he's the the muscle of the group. Yeah, yeah. And because he was a half eaten sandwich and half rotten, his he's not quite all there. So he's a little. I'll just say he's dumb. But he's got the muscle mass. And what was cool about that is, like, if you put them side by side or, like, on the table, it was important for me to, like, literally have him tower directly yeah, over. he does. Major Racer. And, again, that goes into the storytelling elements of the kids didn't have a backstory or anything like that. Like, he looks powerful and muscle, muscular. He hunches over and he just had this overpowering, you know, sense. And the detail. So this was, funny enough, designed by Seba, 100% digital. Oh, okay. and but. But it has the look and feel, the vibe of the handmade elements, just for the little details that, like, I just you, love the plaster stuck it. into the back of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the band aids, the rottenness. He's got like a maggot coming out of one end. So oh, so many it? cool <laughs> little details. And oh, so f- for Food Fighter fan, notice the hat. So that was like my ode to Is Mean that... Wiener. <laughs> there you go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like Mean Weeder having like a 1950s gangster's hat is so yeah, random, yeah. but he's the henchman, and that's what they kind of wore. So yeah, that yeah, was like my throwback. my throwback to that like my favorite you know characters of the uh, the Food Fighters. Um, we can go into the good guys now, the Water Cooler Commandos. Let's do it, Water Cooler right. Commandos. So led by the fearless Major Eraser, a supply never known to make a mistake, only fix them. So going back to Alan, when he had an eraser, yeah. I mean, what is an eraser's sole job but to fix mistakes? He rubs them out of their existence, and yeah. that that personality trait came to to be with Major Eraser. He sees what Colonel Custard is doing is basically creating all these mistakes. He's constantly trying to grab the energy drink and create new minions to take over the office. So Major Eraser's just trying to step, prevent Colonel Custard and prevent that from ever happening and fix him. But the beauty of that is like he has that internal complex of like how they were created was technically a mistake. So I love like small soldiers, the Gorgonites, like at the end of the movie, they know that they're if they were to be discovered by humanity, like it's probably best for them to sail off. Yeah. And I wanted that like complexity to be with his character of like he knows they're not meant to be in that in the world. He knows that like if another human had the understanding of how to create with gensei and electricity, they could create abomination. So mm. he's just out for maintaining office peace, but to make sure that they don't get discovered and super awesome details. This is like, so I like to say like Scott did six characters and Seba did six characters, but there's only 10. So this yeah, was like yeah, a yeah. perfect, perfect marriage between Seba, uh, Scott's work and Seba's. And like, this was, just really well done. Like Seba cleaned up the sculpt, made it a little more. Um, Cause that was the, one of the issues is just like when you have the handmade stuff, how does get that into production? And then at the time I did have a little more articulation with the figures. Cause I just didn't know how to I split because I, I see a lot of reviews, you know, people don't like five point articulation, which is 100% understandable. They like but, more. Yeah. And like, oh, really? The more articulation you have, the more costly it begins. And I, yeah, of course, uh, yeah, yeah. But to stay true to the 90s inspire, like I wanted to make them five points, you know, so they're perfect. My, I don't need no more articulation, in my opinion. I think they're great. So the next up, Lieutenant Led, the second in command. Um, by the way, I know the ranks are you know, brigadier out majors, but <laughs> it's the 90s, I'm not supposed to be specific, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look at that with the, I didn't even clock that before. Uh, His gun that's like a bent biro lid. Yeah, so what's cool is that Scott did this one. And what I love is like, I'm sure in your film career, you hire people, you know, people always, oh, yeah, I can do it. Like they just, they're here to get paid. The first initial reactions are like, yeah, that's cool. I like it. But over time, you know, you start seeing when they really start loving A, the story or the script or something, they really, oh, what if we do this? You start seeing their creativity. And the same thing happened with Scott. Like he, he was awesome to begin with, but you saw his mind start like firing off his imagination. Mm-hmm. And I, t- I told him like, yeah, just play with some, I gave him some ideas with you know, the, like a, a PDF of like all these 
different supplies and my attempts at making weapons. I sent him that for inspiration. And like he comes up with stuff like this and it's just That was his idea really, that the gun. Yeah. Oh man. And I mean so it's good. just so cool that we and I he was sending me photos of the Pringles character for instance and in the background would be Pringles actual like food so he's doing like there's his research yeah, yeah. I see broken chopsticks and like a exacto blade and etc like in the background and then voila like that ends up being if I can get focus the focus that ends up being oh, yeah, the, uh, yeah. the weapon I'm like I that's love awesome. that and it's such cool little details that that's exactly what I'm hoping for like when these guys get into your hands in the real world like you can create your own weapons and accessories. And that's actually something I want to expand upon once this uh, gets through. Well, the everyone's line. got like, if you've got an office and a desk, you've got like just those little boxes of crap and bits of, bits of pencil <laughs> shavings and stuff where you can start putting it together and just like, it must have been a real good way to like create ideas for weapons because it's all there. It's just like jigsawing them together to see what works well as a toy. Exactly, man. I love it. So next up is Brigadier Bouncy. Yeah, so he's the... Dope comedic relief of and then check out his weapon so it's like a highlighter bazooka oh yeah and again, something <laughs> with again little, that uh, was with, with one of these like a small what i don't know what they're called those little things but like yeah. a small version but a binder clip yeah yeah so yeah, this was binder clip this is what's cool is like i can't draw at all but i can be creative so i'd send photos of this this is a weapon that i came up with sent it to scott just like a photo and then he replicated it on his end which was just cool like they have that like dynamic of like oh this is what i'm thinking can you make this da 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 and the same thing happened with seba like one of the the digital sculptors one of the the weapons i had in mind was like this blowtorch that's with a double a battery and like oh, yeah. three <laughs> thumbtacks and it's like a welding torch so like ideally he's the mechanic of, of yeah yeah same. but i did that in my house you know wrapped it all up with rubber bands sent to the seva and no joke like within 30 minutes to 45 minutes it was like a digital sculpt i was like this is no awesome way. yeah 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 and that's the fun like i just love like vibing off of each other like creating something from nothing yeah but brigadier bouncy he's like the comedic relief of everything like he's the explosion specialist probably not a good mix but he's a fun <laughs> character he's exploding throwing out farts and belches along the way. <laughs> and I love the when I look at that, I, I see like a little bit Mad Balls, but then like a little bit Ghostbusters. Oh. It's oh like, it's, it's all that stuff that we love, do you know what I mean? And it's all like mixed into this one thing. He fucking nailed it. So yeah. again, going back to my PDF of working with the original artist, I was taking samples from all these things that I love. And Slimer, just a large entity with all of the expressions through the mouth, you know? Yeah, yeah. Which was supposed to be like a John Belushi originally <laughs> kind of inspired yeah. character. But that was 100% like one of the inspiration is like, I wanted a character that was very expressive. And although at the moment this is done in like a non-bouncy material, this is going to be my goal to once he's in production to actually make him a, a, a bouncy. Like, yeah, yeah, make you have a be able to little bit of bounce. off his arms. Yeah, so it's, it can be used as it's intended. Um, so next up is my favorite figure that, even though Major was like from my heart and my childhood, this one ended up being one of my favorites is that we decided to make him out of like an actual scotch tape uh, <laughs> spencer. And by taking off his arms and like taking off the kilt, you're able to pop in your own tape dispenser. And what's sick is that like it literally will work as like uh, for him to rappel down or wrap around other oops, work around other uh, bad guys. And he comes with his welding torch because he's the the bandits. Um, I'm sorry, the water cooler commandos mechanic. Everything, by the way, this is all prototypes, so it'll be cleaned up and like they have been used in the film, so they're all beat up from me playing and throwing them around on camera. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as Scotch tape, you know, you fix things, you 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 match things together, and that's what his character brings. The inspiration was the the uh mechanic from tailspin if you remember him yeah yeah and yeah. he was just like goofy but genius character that can come up with shit out the top of his mind and that was like that was one of my favorite characters growing up from tailspin like that, that show was awesome so that's my like throwback to him and then we've got a peanut last next. But, he's not the last one yes sir so last but not least is corporal can and one of the ones that was like how the fuck am i gonna make a toy out of a <laughs> can of peanuts and the the he's premise was yeah, so what's cool, but he still fits within the realm. And it was important for me to, like, he be able to, like, in a comic, he, uh, Major Eraser, hides 
and Corporal Cannon so that he can escape bandits. Oh, okay. Um, but it was just little elements of play like that. Like, what's cool is the lid comes off. There's a little shelf inside. Um, I had the prototype here, actually. It shows it easier. So inside, ah. there's a shelf and the, all the peanuts. And I'll show the painted peanuts. But the premise behind this character was the old army men buckets. Yeah. So inside you'd have, you know, different poses of the army men. And inside of Corporal Ken is his peanut spies. So they're cool. You can place them all around your cubicle or house or cabinets, etc. And so Corporal Ken is the communication specialist of the group. And I made the can that because as a kid, <laughs> I would take, you know, those tin cans, you put a string in it and you play telephone. Yeah, and that yeah. was the, the kind of the concept of like, yeah, I can make like a communication specialist communication, out of the, yeah. the, the can. The back, I would love to have like um, a nutrition label for the for the final product. But oh, yeah, that would be wicked, yeah. But he's a cool dude. Very excited that he's actually being resonated with and some, some of a lot of people's favorites. He was one that I was definitely concerned with because like how do you make a toy out of a can, truly? And... I went back and forth with the sculptor on the facial expression because it's, it's yeah, just him. Like, it right. That's everything. So I wanted to find like a mix of a frown, fearful, kind of a smirk, and like I think it, he nailed it. He don't look evil. He still, he still looks like a good guy, even though he's got that like serious expression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the story for Corporal Ken is, again, so each of the factions have one character that technically is opposite of the rest. So Corporal Ken started as a break room bandit until he heard Colonel Custard's plan for to total office domination. He's like a pacifist and perhaps it's because he's made of preservatives. He never had a face, you know, being thrown away and like yeah. he had the, the, the shelf life. So he doesn't share the views of humans being wasteful. He understands like, you know, there's a purpose for everyone. So he disbanded from the bandits and joined the commandos because, you know, he wanted to make sure that, they can maintain office peace after all. I love it, man. And I, the, the stories are so <laughs> solid. No, none of the stories feel like, right, I've got this guy. How can I think of a story and work <laughs> it around? It feels like the story came before the character. I don't know if that was intentional or if, if that's the trajectory of when you created him, but that's the way it feels. It doesn't feel like, yeah. okay, I want I want to do a guy that's uh, a hard drive. How am I going to, an external hard drive, how can I make a character out of that? Like, I feel that the character came bef first. Or it was like yeah. something that you created together at least. Yeah, you know how it can be like when you start writing a script. Once you really develop a character, the script starts writing itself. But you really start yeah. like understanding like, oh, this character goes into this situation. How is he going to handle it? And like everything starts to like, – it's like puzzle pieces. Like you just start falling together. It's really awesome. So like someone asked me like how did the characters come to be? And like I honestly don't have a crazy story because it felt most natural to like – I knew there was supposed to be two factions. You start dividing from there, like, okay, what are the good guys' end goals? What are the bad guys' end goals? Where there, where's their drama? How do they meet? And what would make a good army unit? You know, to me, explosions. You know, <laughs> communications. The 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 Rambo, the 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 second in command that will up for everything. You know, he's a perfect supply. And then just the comedic relief, and like, you start wrapping your head around that, and then. Well, what could be like? I just looked around the house. Like, it was that symbol? Like, I got pencils here. There could be a pen character. No, two pencils. Oh, oh, and they come from the same pencil. Okay. Yeah, yeah. One's evil. Boom. And then rubber band ball. Yeah, that guy just seems fun or like whatever. He looks could be joyful. And then a donut. Like, yeah, there's always a donut in the office. But what if he was the evil one because he was stale? You know? It's like, oh, cool. Then that's the element of him being half eaten. And little things like that just yeah. rolled into what it is today. And was it all stuff that you just created yourself? Because if if so, that's awesome. It just feels like the kind of thing that like you can imagine, like you and your buddies, like just sat together, just spitballing these crazy ideas. Like, oh, write it down, <laughs> write it down. Yeah, the pencil got snapped. But did it all just come from you? Yeah, yeah, it came from me. And I'm I'm grateful. That's I do so have cool. another writing buddy that like I love to work with him and bounce off ideas. Like he helped me co-write the the comic book because pre pre previously to this, we would get together and screenwrite and like come up with show concepts that never you know reached the light of day but when i wanted to make a toy it was important for me to like just have something that i have full i hate to say full control of because it's just it's not about the ego it's just like you want something that you have the means of doing like when it was working with a team it's like relying on someone else's schedule sometimes or yeah, maybe yeah. it's not in your wheelhouse 
And then for me, I just wanted something that like I could just stream con- like creativity and my conscious through it and like have no barriers besides myself, you know? Yeah, Which that's what that's saying. Like happens. too many chefs spoil the broth, don't they? Sometimes you just yeah. need to be fully invested. And then maybe when you've <laughs> created it, then a little bit of feedback. But in the process of creating it, I am very much like that. I just like to be able to just crack on and get on with it. Yeah, and, uh, it I, well, it, it, it was a, it's a testament to, to how well these have come out. And I, I just wish you nothing but success in terms of them like being able to become that mass produced toy because I can fully see him having that potential. <laughs> Thank you so much. Honestly, it's it's seeing other people's reactions that's had been like it's like I said, I want to create recreate this the Saturday morning cartoon era, but by sparking people's imaginations and I'm getting like DMs that are saying just that and it's so cool to see other people like send me sketches of future characters like oh this is my coffee dude or this is a stapler guy and this is how this is I'm like yes people are getting it like they're creating already, you know, for those doodles, sketches of my characters. And like, that's just blowing, like mind blowing, you know, this is just something that I really wanted to make. And I'm just happy it's resonating with others. In terms of um, like people wanting to support it, wanting to put a, a down payment on one and a pre-order, where can they head to? Is it bigbadtoystore.com? Yeah. Or you can just go to 9to5warriors.com. You'll see all of them listed there, the backstories, the commercials, um, and then if you click on the pre-order link, it bounces to Big Bad Toy Store. What's great is that it's a pre-order and you won't be charged until they ship. And at this point, until they ship is roughly probably summer 2013. I'm sorry, 2013. <laughs> summer of 2023. And um, yeah, so if you're on the fence or you're like, oh, these are cool, but I'll wait. Like It helps immensely just to placing the pre-order to show that there's a demand. And once they can go into the production, then, you know that's when the, hopefully the fun happens and people start making their own, you know, adventures. Yeah. So if, if you're a little bit broke now and you're like, oh, do you know what? I would like to have one, but I'm a bit broke. It don't matter because you're not going to get charged until next year, even if they get made anyway. <laughs> yes, I yes, like that. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that that's, that's how it is. You're not going to get charged until it's uh, until they're actually on the way anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and thank you again for having me on. It's been a pleasure. To be yeah. No, not a guys. problem. I, I, I and hopefully we can do this again when they're when they're shipping out and and talking about people's reactions and that kind of thing. But 100%. yeah, man, absolute honor to have you on here. It's been a pleasure and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, dude. Nine to five warriors. Some good, some bad, some crazy, some rad. Commandos and bandits, they both just gotta have it. Nine to five warriors. It's mayhem in an office mosh pit. These are your nine to five warriors. Gentle electricity brought them all to life, you see. This is how they came to be brought to this reality. It happens every day from nine to five. Each figure sold separately. So how cool was that, man? How cool is Brandon Braswell, creator of the 9 to 5 Warriors? I'm buzzing to see these in person. I really, really hope that he hits his goal. If you want to support that, you know what to do. Head over to 9 to 5 warriorscom or the Big Bad Toy Store. I'll put all the links in the description below. You can help support that. And hopefully, in 2023, your desk will be scattered with 9 to 5 Warriors. And how awesome are those things, man? Like I said, I love his inspiration. I love where he draws his ideas from. I love the stuff that he loved growing up. We're all, we're all, we're all kindred spirits in this toy world we really are we do all really love this stuff and the fact that this is a dude that chose to create these back in 2014 not now when these are really popular again food fighters and those kind of toys he's an og he's a dude that liked this from day dot so we need to support that we really do so like i said head over to the links that's in the description and if you want to put pre-orders on any one of them or the whole set i know if i'm gonna do it i need to get at least the whole set come on they're so cool you need the whole the whole range so yeah please do support that and if there's any other guests that you'd like to see me talk with on this show then please let me know in the comments below if there's anyone that you'd like to see me on a show in the future let me know what you think of the nine to five warriors let me know your ideas for future nine to five warriors because if this interview was anything to go by and that how he was talking like these aren't the last that we've seen of the nine to five warriors we need ideas for future ones as well so let me know those in the comments below and yeah man really enjoyed doing this today thank you for tuning in don't forget to add me on instagram if you want to see any exclusive updates on anything that I've got going on I post the most on Instagram that's at Theo underscore Kane underscore Slimehouse and if you want to help support me over on Patreon help me make Slimehouse bigger and better than ever head over to patreon.com forward slash Slimehouse TV and appreciate the support always so without further ado I'm going to crack on with my day I've got loads to do today but I really hope you've enjoyed this podcast interview and I've got some really good other ones lined up as well so stay tuned for them so in the meantime I'm gone bye